Ladies and gentlemen, our next presenter is Whitney Johnson. I first met Whitney when she was working at the Open Society in New York, where she was a founding member of the Documentary for, uh, Photography Project. And actually, just, just to be clear, I met her on the day she was leaving the Open Society. We had breakfast and she announced that she was then going to be joining the New Yorker as Director of Photography. She is now the Director of Visuals and Immersive Experiences at National Geographic. And Whitney has been working with and supporting photographers throughout her career. And she's now in a unique position as she has a strong background in traditional magazine publishing, but now has entered into an exhilarating world of digital storytelling that opens up a seemingly limitless opportunity to present visual content in new and exciting ways. Please welcome Whitney Johnson. Good afternoon. It's nice to be here again. I want to start by taking us back to the beginning. And I mean the very beginning, or at least the beginning for National Geographic, to a moment when pictures first graced the pages of magazines and paved the way for each of us to become the storytellers that we are today. Picture yourself in the early 19th century when before photography, you would only see your own home, your own town, and the limited places you could travel. It was 1890 when National Geographic published the very first photograph in our magazine. This modest image of Russia's Herald Island may not look like an exceptional image, but it did exceptional things. With that step, our readers could see places they had before only heard or read about, or maybe had never even heard existed at all. And with it, our readers, our readers, they became viewers. By 1905, those same viewers, the same ones who knew only their own home, their own town, were transported to Lhasa, Tibet. Through our very first picture story, told in 11, 11 full pages of photographs. I like to imagine a reader receiving their physical copy of National Geographic back then, perhaps delivered by a horse-drawn mail wagon, and entering a world unimaginable only a moment before. I love to think about how those readers must have reacted. The technological feat of photographs taken thousands of miles away, then developed, curated, published, and mailed to your door made that other world real. But why would I take us, embedded here as we are in the modern world, that is not only 132 years, but light years beyond, back to the turn of the last century. To me, there is a direct line from the wonder of that moment, from the thrill of really seeing lives and stories beyond your own, to the precipice we are on today with immersive experiences offered by visual technology in all its forms. What we can rely on is that technology always continues to evolve and offer new outlets for the human impulse to tell a story. Here's how I think about what that through line really means. In our time, when advanced technology is so readily accessible, people are more empowered than ever before to become storytellers. A still image on a printed page was once the only visual medium with the power to transport an audience to an unexplored land, culture, or experience. But now, the ever-growing range of dynamic and immersive visual media, from video to virtual reality, 
as well as the easy distribution by individuals through social media, is democratizing more every day how we all produce and interact with visual content. Technology, as we all know, has allowed anyone with a mobile device, professionals, and citizen journalists alike to become a global communicator, a documentarian, a storyteller. The aperture of who is a storyteller has opened so much and will open further in ways we probably can't imagine now. Rather than meet this with resistance, let's lean into the advantages technology offers storytellers to make a difference. I'm so honored to be here among such accomplished photographers, photography enthusiasts, filmmakers, students, and educators from around the world. Unlike so many of my esteemed colleagues who you've heard from this week, I'm not a photographer. But like most of them, I am a storyteller. And I have been telling stories for as long as I can remember. When I was in second grade, my class put on a play about the dangers of single-use plastic. We called the play The Beach Strikes Back which we performed in public spaces across my hometown of Seattle, Washington. That's me under the little orange sea star costume. As you can see, even from a very early age, I felt connected to telling stories that matter. And based on how much of my childhood was spent looking at our magazine and watching the documentary Secrets of the Titanic, I was and still continue to be captivated by the power of being transported to another place. I guess it's no surprise I ended up working where I am today. I joined National Geographic in 2015 and currently serve as Vice President of Visuals and Immersive Experiences. My vantage point is similar to many of yours. At National Geographic, we are visual storytellers first. That, of course, is our legacy. So I stand before you tonight as both one of you and as a storyteller at National Geographic in the hope that both my background and Nat Geo's can offer inspiration for all of us braving this new and constantly evolving world of visual storytelling. You all, like many, probably see National Geographic as synonymous with photography. That iconic yellow border around so many iconic images. Yet from the beginning, we have also been at the forefront of technological innovation. But these steps forward in storytelling didn't come without tension, as progress usually does. Believe it or not, the shift to telling stories with photographs at National Geographic was met with resistance. When the magazine published that first picture story in 1905 from Tibet, it did so amidst criticism. National Geographic Society board members were outraged, so much so that it caused a few of them to resign in disgust, appalled that such a high quality magazine was turning into a picture book. But this critique of new modes of storytelling did not deter the editor. He followed that first picture story from Tibet with a staggering 138 pages of images from the Philippines just three months later. The pursuit of visual storytelling was matched by technological advancement when the following year an entire issue of the magazine was dedicated to wildlife photography taken by George Shiras, a pioneer of flash photography. His ingenuity contributed to making the brand what it is today. So just as we broke barriers and embraced advancement at the turn of the last century, I believe we should all continue to move the art form of visual storytelling as far forward as technology allows. I am often asked to argue on behalf of the primacy of the still photograph. Don't get me wrong, as we've seen here this week, it is a critically important visual medium with an unmatched ability to memorably crystallize and preserve a moment in time. And this building is filled. It is filled with some of the greats. As I told Jim Noctway earlier this week, and who you'll hear from next, 
I have been looking at his photographs for close to 25 years, and still, I was stopped in my tracks by the power and emotion that he is able to capture in a single frame. I believe the still will always endure. And it's time for some of us to be a bit less precious about it and expand on that. There is every reason to grab with both hands every other technological advancement in visual storytelling and use them for all they are worth. Let's seize the incredible opportunities we have and be wedded not to form, but purpose. With that purpose being a singular focus on advancing not just awareness, but deep understanding, helping people to see in a new way or to understand the unfamiliar more clearly. What we are after, after all, is impact. A perfect example of how photography can catalyze change is one that some of you may have already learned about earlier this week, the photo arc. A more than decade-long and still ongoing effort by National Geographic photographer Joel Sartore, there he is, to document every species living in zoos and wildlife sanctuaries. Joel wants nothing less than to help save the creatures we share this planet with. He started the photo arc in his hometown of Lincoln, Nebraska in 2006. Since then, he has circled the globe and photographed thousands of species in his quest to create this photo archive of global biodiversity. That cobra, photographed right here in the UAE, was species number 12,000. No matter its size, each animal is treated with the same amount of affection and respect. The results are portraits that are not just stunningly beautiful, but also intimate and moving. There is truly nothing like them. So what it takes to create impact on these levels through visual storytelling of all kinds is what I'd like to speak with you about today. What is necessary to drive impact in true cross-cultural, cross-regional, cross-everything understanding in visuals? Meaningful content, powerful storytellers, and strategic distribution. So let's begin with the characteristics of truly change-making content and how technological advancements are improving what we're able to capture. A storyteller, as most of you know, constructs a narrative by determining how, what, and where, moving you from informative content, which accurately depicts a moment, to content that conveys real emotion and a larger meaning. Done right, the world gets content that surprises, educates, challenges, and impacts audiences. The work of our Nat Geo photographers proves time and again how impactful that emotional response to a visual can be in promoting understanding of the world around us. Amy Vitale's portrait of the last male northern white rhino helped people understand that we are witnessing extinction in our natural world. Martin Scholler's portraits of people exonerated from death row helped readers understand the inequities of capital punishment in the United States. The former governor of Virginia found Chris Graves' image of a Confederate monument transformed into a Black Lives Matter monument of such historic significance that he included it in a time capsule that replaced the Confederate statue. And there's Joshua Irwandi's image of the body of a presumed COVID-19 victim, which forced citizens and the Indonesian government alike to address the seriousness of the virus. Sometimes images are used as evidence. In the mid-1800s, Carlton Watkins' images of Yosemite showed people living in the eastern United States what the West actually looked like, and led to the Yosemite Act, which in turn paved the way for the national park system. More than 100 years later, a similar narrative emerged when staff photographer Michael Nick Nichols documented the beauty and wildlife of more than 2,000 miles of pristine Central African rainforest. These spellbinding photographs helped persuade the government of Gabon to set aside 10% of its national territory, forests that might otherwise have gone to timber companies, to create 13 national parks. Now let's talk about where technology and creativity collide. 
The world has gone from riding in horse-drawn carriages to sending civilians into space. So we too, as storytellers, must advance our techniques of capturing content to bring those new experiences to our audiences and make the far away feel a little more familiar. Just as Anand Varma does here, using a high-speed video camera to make the invisible visible. We're certainly not the only visual trailblazers, by a long shot, but photo engineers at National Geographic have made significant contributions to our ability to make photographs that others cannot. We pioneered flash photography, the first underwater photography, the highest aerial photograph at the time, the first color photographs from the air, the first use of Kodachrome color film, the list, it goes on and on. And more recently, the first 360 degree video from the International Space Station. Many of our most remote and difficult visuals are a result of some wild innovations. Though not your most common solution, underwater photographer David Dubelay once enlisted the photo engineering department to help him solve the problem of triggering an underwater time lapse of a ship being sunk using a coil of wires and a toilet bowl float draped over the side of the ship. The department built a remote controlled camera hidden inside a paper mache sage grouse to document rare mating behavior. They built remote triggered cameras to capture the intricate moves of Alex Honnold climbing without ropes on the face of Yosemite's El Capitan. And at other times, they simply reimagine and build cameras to withstand the tough conditions National Geographic photographers are famous for working in. Our upcoming project with NASA is one I'm especially excited about and exemplifies the limitless opportunities technology now offers. Nat Geo was selected to help tell the story of Artemis II, the first Artemis flight that will carry astronauts around the moon and back to Earth aboard the agency's Orion spacecraft in pursuit of a return to the moon. We are collaborating on compact, lightweight hardware to fly inside the capsule that will enable us to create an immersive audiovisual experience from aboard the spacecraft. Artemis is not just about sending the next four humans to the moon. It is about bringing the moon back to the eight billion people on Earth as never before. We've talked about making wise choices about what and how you photograph. Let's talk for a moment about the very important choices related to who is behind the camera. Technology, <laughs> technology has opened vast new horizons in our ability to capture images, but it has not and it will not replace the need for an artistic eye, a storyteller's instinct, and creative vision. That is where the storyteller comes in. Visuals offer a gateway to break down stereotypes and counter existing or preconceived narratives, and it is the storyteller who holds the keys to unlock this impact. It is through their keen eye that we get the most impactful, most evocative, and most important stories, images, and moments. The lived experiences of people behind the camera, intentionally or not, can influence their decisions of what and how to photograph. So we must differentiate between perspective, which can make the storytelling richer, and bias, which can cloud the storytelling if not balanced with journalistic tools. We must also celebrate the broadest possible variety of lived experiences. In the April 2018 issue of the magazine, National Geographic acknowledged its history of reinforcing and reflecting racial stereotypes. We committed then to do better, not only through the stories we tell and how we tell them, but by empowering a diverse group of photographers, writers, producers, and editors who are behind the work. What does that look like for us? Through the first century of publication, photographers were dispatched out to the world's many corners to cover various locations. Most were white, male, and Western. Now, we are moving away from capturing the world largely through a singular lens and are constantly broadening our voices by geography, race, ethnicity, by gender, by age, 
by belief system. The global pandemic accelerated our use of more photographers around the globe, opening the aperture on our storytellers and expanding our view from a narrow one to a much more global perspective, a perspective that really reflects the world that National Geographic covers. Now let's talk about another role, and one that is particularly close to my heart. That, of course, is the role of the editor. A photo editor is so much more than a picture picker. Advocate, coach, mentor, therapist, fixer, producer, problem solver, journalist. Our job is to help the photographer succeed. Sometimes, we are validated and even encouraged to feel important, but none of what we do is possible without others. If anyone is the most important, it's the photographer, always and forever. And together, we work in service of the story. The photographers in the room here today know the number of images that can come out of just one day in the field. And we know the editing process to select the best images to define a story can be exhausting. In 2020, National Geographic photographers were sent on more than 300 assignments and captured nearly 2 million photographs, which were then narrowed down to the several hundred that were published in the magazine and online. The same was true for this year's Year in Pictures. With all that occurred over the year, one cover image just wasn't enough. Instead, we created four, reflecting the four biggest stories of the year. COVID-19, climate change, conflict, and for us, conservation. The role that we play in amplifying particular images, whether on the cover of our magazine or on our Instagram feed, is critical, and great responsibility comes with it. The decision can make an image part of the conversation. The point here? The point is that all of our work is stronger when we have multiple voices as both photographers and editors making and looking at images and helping us to understand cultural differences. With our obligation to advance real cross-cultural understanding, we must encourage more voices to share stories and help audiences understand cultural details that may have not been seen or understood before. I don't think it gets said often enough. Creativity flourishes with diversity. Now let's talk about reaching our audience. Perhaps no other element of visual storytelling has transformed more drastically than the methods through which we all share our content today. The internet of the 2000s, what we might call Web 1.0, and digital photography completely changed the speed with which we could capture content and the media could deliver it to the public. With Web 2.0, our experience of the last decade, we carry the internet in our pocket and are engaged in an ongoing conversation with the community. Everyone is now a photographer. Smartphones let anyone take high-quality photographs and videos and easily edit them with preset filters and editing tools. Everyone is now a publisher. Each of us can now reach hundreds, thousands, if you're lucky, even millions of people around the world with the push of a button. And the feedback? It's almost instant. Publishing a picture or a story is no longer the end game. It's just the beginning of a relationship and conversation with your audience. Some view this democratization of visual storytelling and the advent of social media platforms as a threat to the art form or overall impact of photography. I have been asked if it pains me to see National Geographic photographs on a smartphone screen rather than in the magazine. My reaction? Absolutely not. I love knowing that the visuals of our magazine circulate beyond the page. What better way to ensure global impact than to give storytellers an instant platform through which to share their visuals with a worldwide audience? Everywhere you go in the world, people know National Geographic. But in my experience, only a fraction have ever seen the magazine. 
To make the print image alone so precious is doing a disservice to ourselves. As storytellers and journalists, we should care most about people seeing the photographs and engaging with the story. The photographs that work in a printed magazine or on a gallery wall may not be the same photograph that works on a small screen. We must make different curatorial, different journalistic choices. And we must be more ambitious about imagining and creating these stories and in exercising different forms of storytelling to do so. For me, it's not a question of what's better. It's a question of what's appropriate for each particular space. Remember that yellow border, the frame around so many iconic photographs? Now, we're turning the yellow border into a portal, a portal to the world. At Nat Geo, we challenge ourselves to expand on the photography that we are most known for and welcome the compelling nature of these immediate, immersive visual approaches. A still image on a printed page was once the only visual medium with the power to transport an audience to an unexplored land, culture, or experience. Now, the ever-growing range of dynamic and immersive visual media has democratized both how individuals produce and interact with visual content. Let's lean into these advantages that innovation offers storytellers to make an impact. In this era of Web 2.0, National Geographic has embraced augmented reality, taking more than 50 million viewers to the top of Mount Everest. Then we traveled beyond our own planet, taking viewers to the surface of Mars with the very first images sent back from the Perseverance rover. Virtual reality has opened the door for immersive travel experiences as well, satisfying a need to explore and offering an experience one might not have otherwise had in the real world. I know I wouldn't be face to face with an elephant this way. It's an entirely new mode of armchair travel. And once again, the global pandemic, the one that opened the door on more storytellers, has changed the landscape, accelerating society's understanding of what is possible in the digital space. So what's next? We are not far from scaling these dynamic immersive technologies to make them more accessible. Web 3.0 will be a world that we can inhabit and evolve. The metaverse, yeah, that's a scary word. But the metaverse, it will offer even more new ways to expand what visual storytelling can mean, even as our understanding of what the metaverse is remains a work in progress. Here's one of our photographers, Aaron Huey, uh, on assignment in the metaverse a couple weeks ago. Simply put, the metaverse is the next leap in storytelling opportunity. While current technology has moved us so far in the last decade, I think we can all agree we exist only at the very inner edge of our imagination of what it will mean to all our lives. Entertainment, work, education, family, shopping, travel in the coming years and decades. In closing, I will say that no matter the form, Visuals show us places and things we may never get to see in person. They express conflict in a visceral and enduring way, and they can be transformative. Whether it be photographs, videos, virtual reality, visuals can cause us to think differently or move us emotionally, sometimes in ways that propel us into action. Like those readers seeing photographs from a faraway place at the turn of the last century, but with a whole new approach to creation and delivery of content, our audiences today are opening their eyes to new worlds, new possibilities, new stories. Let's embrace our chance to keep expanding the art form of visual storytelling as, as far forward as technology allows us in ever more ways to do that. We can harness the power of that singular, crystallized moment in time represented by those images from Tibet and do fantastical new things. The viewers of 2090 will benefit from our ambition and our forethought. I'd like to end with a personal story. Like I said, I'm not a photographer. 
apart from a darkroom photography course I took in high school, and posting way too many pictures of my children on Instagram. But I have always been a storyteller, from that little starfish in Seattle to university where I studied American literature and art history. But it wasn't until I met the photographer Susan Mizellis that I became interested in the power of visual journalism. She didn't understand how someone who studied storytelling and art history was not interested in photojournalism. So Susan, being Susan, she took me under her wing and she mentored me. I helped her to curate a photography exhibition and in doing so, she taught me how to see a good picture and how to make choices about which images best told the story. She advised on a grant program I ran called the Audience Engagement Grant that supported photographers to put their work in front of the audience who most needed to see it to impact change. Fast forward 20 years and I find myself thinking about how we can be at the cutting edge of visual storytelling, how we can meet our audience where they are with technology and where they interact with media now. What those questions about technology and new ways to use and think about it is really pointing us toward is the proposition we began with here today. And that's just this. As technology propels us forward and offers new opportunities, the core values of great visual storytelling learned from my first mentor and so many others along the way unite what we're doing and where we're going. Those core values don't change even as the means for expressing them change and change again. Meaningful content, powerful image makers, and strategic delivery. We cannot know what new forms our visual stories will take from here. But I hope you will join me in exploring and embracing what's to come and using it to impact the world. Thank you.